please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hi there, good morning. Welcome, you're watching CNBC TV 18 as we kickstart new trading week. This is Power Breakfast. I'm Mangla Malu and with me in the Mumbai News Center, Ekta Batra. Good morning, Ekta. Hi, Mangla. Morning. Well, let's get going in terms of the top stories that we're tracking on the start of a fresh new week. Asia starts on a subdued note after a weak handover from Wall Street on Friday. Sentiment remains subdued as investors focus on US tax reforms. How will the Lal Street fare in today's trade as global queues remain weak and the Moody's induced rally saw some profit taking on Friday? Well, the SGX Nifty indicates a flat start. Based on a fresh review of the current and evolving liquidity conditions, the RBI has withdrawn the open market sale or the OMO scheduled for the 23rd of November. Experts say this move could help the bulls today. Mega order win boost for Larson and Trubro after l and Construction bags the Mumbai Trans Harbour Link order valued at 86.50 crores. The proposed Mumbai Trans Harbour Link will serve as an economic getaway to Navi Mumbai, connecting the Nava Sheva Airport, port rather, the Mumbai Pune Expressway and the Mumbai Goa Highway. And a big pharma deal announced over the weekend. Uh, Bangalore-based drug maker Stride Shasun agrees to sell its domestic branded formulations business to Eris Life Sciences for 500 crores. All right, before we go further, let's get a handle on what's taking place in the Asian markets. By and large, mixed as we speak, given uh, the sort of weak cues that we got from the U.S. equities last Friday, that was amidst lingering concerns about tax reform. The Wall Street posted a two-week losing streak after a fair point. The Euro 2 skid after German coalition hit talks hit an impasse. On the data front, we're getting uh, weak data coming in from Japan. The exports rose about 14%. That compares with a poll of close to 16%. And the trade surplus in Japan, too, was around 285 billion yen. That compares with an expectation of a surplus of 330 billion yen. Uh, so the Japanese market's down about four tenths of a percent, underperforming the Asian pack. But if you take a look at the Korean markets, the Straits, as well as the Taiwanese indices, all of them should come up for you mildly in the green as we speak. Two and a half points on the Korean index and uh, similar pedestrian moves on uh, the Straits, as well as the Taiwanese indices. The SGX Nifty, though, remember, we saw some profit taking in the last hour of trade on Friday, indicates a mild uptick of close to around 18 to 20 points as we speak, as far as the open on our markets are concerned. Okay, well, let's tell you what happened on Wall Street. U.S. stocks fell on Friday as worries about tax reform lingered. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average declined 100 points. The S&P finished 0.2% lower, while the Nasdaq Composite fell 0.1% as shares of Amazon, Netflix and Alphabet declined, which is basically the tech sector. Concerns remain about whether tax reform, in fact, could be achieved by your end. There are also concerns about some key differences arising between the House and the Senate tax plans. While speaking in an exclusive to CNBC, Treasury Secretary Steve Munchen uh, said that he expects a Republican tax reform bill to be sent to President Donald Trump by Christmas. Here's a slice of that conversation. We're going to have the Senate as soon as they get back from Thanksgiving vote on the bill and uh, our expectation it would go to conference right away and we have every reason to think we'll get it to the president's desk uh, before Christmas for him to sign. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to come at it from, from just the opposite while I have you and then I'm going to go let Andrew uh, take over again. But I got a call yesterday from someone who lives in New York, pretty well-to-do guy, uh, talked to his accountant. His taxes are going through the, the roof. How do you answer that, that he's actually getting a huge tax increase from a Republican administration? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm sensitive to this issue, having lived in New York and California, and I've literally spoken to hundreds of business people in both those states. So first of all, as we've said, the objective of the plan is to simplify taxes and level the playing field. So we're getting the federal government out of subsidizing states, and that obviously does impact the high-tax states. Um, having said that, uh, for someone who makes $100,000, dollars 
in high tax states, they will get tax cuts. For people who make a million dollars or more, um, their taxes are going to go up on the personal side. Now, having said that, they're going to get the benefit of business tax reduction, which will be very, very good for New York. They're going to get the benefit of pass-through reduction, which will be very good for small and medium-sized businesses and entrepreneurs. All right, but uh, moving across the European uh, markets, the indices out there closed fairly lower with the UK's FTSE. That one was the outperformer there with a cut of just about 0.8%, 0.08%. The French index as well as the German indices, both of them fell about 3 tenths to 4 tenths of a percent respectively. Retail stocks, they were one of the worst performers. So the likes of H&M, Inditex, which owns Zara, both of them down about 2.5%, 3% each. Media stocks, best performers. We got news coming in from Sky as well as Vivendi, both of them gaining about 4 to 5 percent on the back of potential mergers. And uh, investors also digested some remarks coming by from the ECB president, Mario Draghi, who said that the ECB does need to be patient while normalizing the monetary policy across the periphery too. We saw a fair bit of red, but the emerging market space, the Russian index should come up for you. That one saw a gain of almost about uh, a half a percent, and the Brazilian index too saw about 1.3 percent gains there. So the emerging market's really outperforming. Okay, well, staying with Europe then, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, uh, Merkel's efforts to form a three-way coalition government that would secure her a fourth term hit a major setback on Sunday as talks among four German parties broke down after the pro-business free Democrats pulled out, citing uh, differences which could not be solved. The FDB said that uh, the three parties could not find compromises on key issues like immigration, and the environment. The decision by the FTP means that Merkel will either seek to form a minority government with the Greens or a new election itself will be held. Angela, Angela Merkel will meet the German president later today to inform him that she had failed to form a coalition government. Energy prices in focus. They're in focus amid heightened tension in the Middle East between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Remember, Saudi Arabia has called for an emergency talk with Ir <coughs> the Arab League, saying they will not tolerate Iran's interference in Arab affairs. Saudi Arabia wants to now raise this issue with the UN Security Council. Right, and what does all this do to crude prices? They rebounded after falling for five straight sessions as a major U.S. crude pipeline was shut and traders anticipated an OPEC deal to extend curbs on production. In the currency space then, the dollar fell against a basket of other major currencies as Treasury yields slipped and investors remained sceptical of U.S. Rep Republicans' efforts to pass tax cuts. And from precious metals, gold gains as the US dollar dips on uncertainty over the Trump tax bill. Back home on the last street on Friday, Friday, the euphoria of the rating upgrade from Moody's tapered off towards the end of the session with the Nifty and the Sensex closing with gains of over half a percent. The Nifty Bank, in fact, outperformed and closed the day with gains of around 280 points. Mid-cap index also closed around a percent higher. So overall, yes, it was a good session, but we were off the day's high. Manglam, what's today looking like? Absolutely, Ekta, you said it there. You know, it was a good session in the sense that we did get that cheer coming in from the Moody's upgrade. But then again, remember, we ended off the high point of the day on Friday itself. If you take a look at the Nifty, Sensex, as well as the Nifty Bank, all of them losing anywhere between 60 to 200 points from the high point of the day. The Nifty ended below that 10,300 mark itself. But then again, remember, later in the evening, we got data coming in from both the FIIs and the DIIs as far as the flows are concerned. And both of them seemed extremely positive. A lot of people were talking about how the FII flows will now come into the markets given the upgrade. And we saw it immediately, a 1,300 crore buy figure coming in from the FIIs as well as the domestic institutional investors, both of them together adding close to 2,750 crores in our markets. But then again, remember, just take a look at the futures and options space out there. There was some selling at the high point of the day. The futures premium, that one fell from 36 points to about 25 points. The FII long exposure, remember on Friday we were going in with a lot of positive cues and people were talking about that short covering coming in. That did not come by. The FII long exposure is still 50%. And if you take a look at the internals out there, yes, the FII's added a few long positions on Friday, but they added some short positions as well. So there was no real short covering that was witnessed apart from one of those option strikes that took place out there. Even in options, the FII's add 
added more puts than long calls. That means they are on the side of caution. Remember, all of November, there are no real major triggers coming in for our markets. The big triggers like Gujarat election, RBI policy, US Fed meet, all of them come now only in December. So up until then, we're likely to follow global queues as well as technical. So global queues, as far as today are concerned, Asia has uh, opened mixed after US ended lower. The SGX Nifty indicates a mild green tick at the outset. But if you take a look at the technical levels, where we are right now, nearly 10285, that is important because the fall that we had from 10452 to about 10118, this marks a 50% recovery from there. So that is important. And other than that, we've been hovering between the 20 as well as the 50-day moving average. Those two levels become important markets uh, markers for our markets. Okay, and stocks? Stocks, I'll be watching out for cement stocks in particular, given the Supreme Court ban that came by on pet coke. So expect a bit of a red tick coming by on JK Lakshmi Ultra Tech, but a bigger red tick coming in on Shri Cement. That's what Nigel tells me. Maruti, that stock will be in focus given Suzuki and Toyota have tied up for Indian electric vehicles. We got some notes come by from Credit Suisse and Nomura. They see this as a positive for Maruti because of their long-term concerns of electric vehicles. Infosys, we got some more details come by on the buyback. The date, it opens on November 30th, closes on December 14th. l &T, that big boy will be in focus on the back of the big order that came by. Uh, they will build... Navi Mumbai, or rather Mumbai Trans Harbour Link at an order value of close to 8650 crores. Additionally, also watch out for RIIL and Jacob, anything to do with Navi Mumbai. Usually, these stocks keep flying. Sensex, uh, Sipla and Lupin have been thrown out of that index, while Yes Bank and Indusin have been included in the 30 stock index. Sun Pharma sources say that Baska facility inspection has been uh, completed by the US FDA, so watch out for some green tick there. Mayur Unicoters, they got their results, 15% growth on the revenue, margins by and large maintained, but the company has announced a 1% equity buyback, close to around 25 crores. Strides and Eris, you were talking about that big deal. We'll discuss more of that in detail through the course of this show. And finally, we have Divi Labs. Uh, we understand that the uh, US FDA has given an establishment inspection report, which is an all clear, more or less, to their unit to uh, remember they had lifted uh, the import alert from this unit about two weeks ago. Well, Modi's upgrade has interpreted that India's potential is likely to materialize. That's the word coming in from former RBI Governor Y. V. Reddy speaking exclusively to Lata Venkatesh. Dr. Reddy says the measures to strengthen the Indian economy are in fact in place. Many of the reforms undertaken in the recent past had two Im implications. One, some sort of disruption in the short term and potential for very good things in the medium term. So I think Moody's in a way is trying to say that though there is some disruption now, it's going to result in good things and perhaps in a way strengthening the forces in favor of good things type of thing. Okay. Uh, so, but I think it's, it's, it's really a, a potential which they interpret is likely to materialize. How would you interpret it? Uh, do you think the steps undertaken and if you can even tell me which steps uh, and no, whether I think they... basically definitely the GST issue. But more important is the ecosystem, like insolvency uh, code. See, the, the fundamental institutional underpinnings that, that should strengthen the ecosystem of finance. Are in place? Are in place. Are, at least there is an attempt to do that in a big way, which is pending for a long time. And so, therefore, I think uh, even GST it has been in the making for 17 years. So if, obviously, there are a lot of difficulties. Otherwise, we should wait for 17 years. So there are difficulties, but they are prepared to face it. So I think in, in that sense, Modi represents, Modi's rating represents a hope which is, uh, there, is, is backed by reasonable expectations. Uh, now, of course, the big uh, news from the government is that they have announced 2.1 lakh crore of capital. Uh, do you think that uh, that addresses uh, the problem or do you think it should be preceded or at least accompanied by some reforms. You don't see in the actual uh, scheme of things, though you can make an attempt, structurally and historically that can't happen. You see, basically what you are doing is for the sins of the past to ensure that normal activity goes on, you have to put in. Capital. So unless you decide in advance to sell, mm. the moment you have decided to put in capital, you are putting in capital. Whatever conditions you put, you can't put conditions for the capital. You are only telling the management to do it. You have to hope for the best. You can't withdraw the capital. So there's no recourse. Yes. 
there is no recourse. But what would you have at least post facto the government? No, I think I would, say, I would I would definitely say that immediately you have to move the capital so that the activity goes on. They should not choke. It does look like a citizen's money or taxpayer's yes. money is and being we are, we are used without let or hindrance. Yeah. But the key reform would be what? That's where I think you have to take a view about the mix of public sector and private sector. You would yeah. prefer fewer banks, fewer public sector No, no, banks. no. My limited point is why money is locked up, taxpayers. You are paying more. Tell me why you want public sector banks. If you say public sector banks are required for backward areas, then strengthen those banks which are operating in backward areas, if you want some. Okay. Is it, my point is you think also you do the consolidation efficiency. If you want public sector banks to be as efficient as private sector banks and perform exactly like that, then why have a public sector bank? So now you have to design a public sector bank which has a purposive existence, which commands the assistance that are required. Fair enough. Sir. So that's my point. And then, but I believe that in an overall sense, particularly for conditions, there should be a minimum presence. That came by over the weekend, well, based on a fresh review of the current and evolving liquidity conditions, the Reserve Bank has withdrawn the open market sale operation scheduled for November 23rd. Experts say this move could help the bulls today. Lata uh, Venkatesh now joins in with what this means for the bonds as well as the equity markets. Lata, take it away. Uh, yes, sir. the Reserve Bank has been doing open market sale of bonds mm -hmm. so that it could uh, uh, mop up the excess liquidity created after de uh, the demonetization a uh, year ago. Now, so far they have done 10 uh, such uh, open market operations. You, each, each is usually 10,000 crores. The last one was announced the week before and was intended for November 23rd. But uh, the yields went over 7%, uh, as we know, went up to 706. Uh, Moody's doesn't have much of an impact on the yields. Also, there was an initial uh, sentiment mm -hmm. uh, uh, impact pushing the yield down to 6.96. Uh, it went back. It ended Friday at 7.04, so practically only a two basis point impact. That's because you know, the FIs limits have already been reached. So even if there is an upgrade or whatever, nobody can come ahead and buy. Uh, the, with the Reserve Bank cancelling this summarily after market hours on Friday, the feeling is that the Reserve Bank itself is not comfortable with yields going above 7%. That's how the market will read it. So today you must expect the yields to revisit 696 and stay there because this one has a direct bearing. Mm. Uh, you know, if the Reserve Bank has, is giving a signal that it's unhappy with yields above 7, then the market will take that and therefore there is likelihood of sustainability of yields below the 7% mark. That will be positive, of course, for NBFCs. They were the ones who were punished most. Uh, they borrow from the wholesale market. So obviously, they were punished most when the yields went over 7%. Uh, even uh, stocks like Yes Bank, which take exposure to corporates through the bond mm -hmm. market and also have uh, a lot of bonds. Uh, PNB has uh, a large number of duration bonds. All these banks will also benefit because they'll have mark-to-market gains. All right, Lata, thanks a lot for that. So basically, less bonds in the market, more demand for the existing bonds. That means the price of that goes up, the yields come down. That's what we've understood. Thanks a lot for that. With that, let's move on to a big pharma deal in the making. The Bengaluru-based drug maker Strides Shasun has agreed to sell its domestic branded formulations business to Ahmedabad-based Eris Life Sciences for 500 crore rupees. The deal involves domestic brands of Strides, while manufacturing facilities of the firm will continue to support its global generic businesses. Ekta, what does this mean for both the companies? Well, it is definitely a positive move because uh, on one end, uh, we have Strides, which is going to reduce its debt by 400-odd crores, and its margins are going to improve. And on the other hand, we have Eris Life Sciences, which is, remember, 100% domestic-focused business. It just has sales in the domestic market and not in any uh, overseas market and uh, what will help them is that a lot of the brands that they're going to be acquiring from strides in this deal is uh, going to push them up uh, when it comes to their central nervous system uh, portfolio so it will propel them to the top 10 when it comes to the CNS uh, portfolio and plus it won't be too much of an impact in terms of uh, the funding because uh, it is expected to be via internal accruals plus debt but uh, overall it shouldn't stress their balance sheet too much because their net cash of around 400 crores in their books so basically what they have in terms of, terms of treasury income should probably 
negate what they have in terms of any sort of incremental debt that they take on. So overall, it is a positive deal. It's been done at around 2.7 times FI17 sales, 2.8 times EV to sales for strides. And what it does for them is that it will definitely boost up their margins because this is a single digit uh, kind of high single digit kind of margin business. And their margins, which they average is around um, you know, mid-teens to up to uh, mid-teens at this point in time, and hence that should probably propel them to a higher level. So overall, it's a positive deal which has taken place. Strides will have very little exposure in the Indian market, whereas Eris is probably going to strengthen its portfolio when it comes to its uh, domestic uh, business. So overall, I think it's a win-win. All right. On to our special series now, Asian Tigers. NBC TV 18's Udyan Mukherjee has been speaking to some of the most influential FIIs in the Asian region. And here he is in conversation with Ayaz Mutiwala of uh, Nivalis Partners. Udyan began by asking him his approach to stocks and sectors, beginning with their thought process behind the investment in NNT Infotech. The premise uh, earlier uh, uh, has been that you know mid-cap IT per se, and uh, you know and rightly proven uh, has has really not uh, stacked up against what the four or five large-cap peers have done in the past, and 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 so essentially it's always been a little bit of this valuation game that you you talk about, and we've seen that catch-up trade being played out between sort of 2013 and 15. Uh, for for uh, for players which have made it, such as say a mine tree which comes. Uh, immediately at the top of the head. Now, uh, here we are at a crossroad of an opportunity, and there is this company which has uh, largely through an organic uh, fashion over the last 15, 20 years, part of a division of LNT and then moved on, uh, has become close to a billion dollar revenue run rate company. Uh, it is on the cusp of change because the industry is changing in, indeed, and we see digital transformation projects being a large constituent uh, of the new uh, sort of uh, uh, RF, RFPs, RFQs, which are going on in the industry. So for, for this to actually make an investment case on, on, on a medium term basis, it actually has to deliver plain old earning growth uh, with uh, the profitability, profitability being maintained and intact. So, uh, so the investment case is back to saying that this company uh, is, is in, an, in a relative sense uh, nim more nimble and smarter is going to get uh, market incremental market share uh, more than what it exists in its base and thus grow uh, you know in this sort of 12 to 15 percent kind of range uh, to to be able to attract incremental investors beyond what we've owned up because these investors are currently naysayers who are not excited by uh, by the prospects of 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 it in general and um, you know in some sense they're saying you know show me the growth so these companies, uh, the way out is indeed going to be to be able to participate uh, and capture, uh, you know, incremental growth in the industry and, and, and thus make, uh, you know, worthy sense. What is true of IT, is it also true in your book of pharmaceuticals? And are you able to spot opportunities in mid-cap pharmaceuticals given the mayhem which is going on? I mean, some bad news comes in, a DVs or a Lupin or a Sun, and stocks tank 20-25%. Are you brave enough to wade through there and try and pick out one mid-cap pharma which can actually deliver the goods. Right. So as we've sort of uh, you know spoken in the past, that it's become uh, you know sort of newsy and uh, you know very uh, very event-driven, uh, and uh, in in some some sort of odd sense, uh, the timing of the event is is uncontrollable. Where you suddenly get this uh, you know uh, 483 or whatever the announcement is called, and uh, the stocks take a beating. Um, Pharma as a field is is a much more broad based, uh, if you will appreciate, versus uh, uh, especially the past of the IT uh, services business, uh, where you have ADM and you know support services, uh, package installation, etc. Much more more sort of vanilla, more straight uh, and simple businesses. Uh, you have the whole gamut of uh, pharma companies in India, uh, you know, from from an extreme of addressing domestic branded generics business. To doing you know CRO and then you have a mix of all these international companies, the large pharma names, some of which you alluded to, such as the Lubin, Lupin or Ribindo, etc. So, uh, in 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 our our sort of uh, our attempt uh, uh, right now is is to try and see what is the downside, which we are always focused on, and uh, and and basically see if 
the business is is going to be affected by you know externalities such as uh, you know an announcement on uh, process uh, or, or 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 how the research is is conducted etc which is is completely an uncontrollable factor uh, both from uh, from our perspective in particular but also from a company's perspective for the way they've operated over the last 15 20 years so um, uh, so to put a put a you know you know sort of concrete uh, you know uh, wrapper around what we are talking we are essentially looking at uh, a, a more domestic opportunities uh, which in some sense are sort of the you know branded consumer generics uh, pharmaceutical companies like like fmcg product like uh, but the nature being basically pharma uh, as such and this was the nature of the uh, the multinational companies such as glaxo uh, uh, you know who operated in india in in, in that capacity so we are going back to that kind of uh, you know aspect of the business there is aventis etc where we feel that, that there could be a relative opportunity uh, to this uh, you know para four challengers the generic growth opportunity complex generics is what people talk about etc so our understanding of that is is currently limited we are, we are indeed working on that but uh, what we are more focused on in 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 the near term is the domestic opportunity all right, uh, let's move on then. There's more bad news for debt-laden Reliance Communications after Moody's withdraws its uh, corporate family rating and its negative outlook. At the same time, Moody's has also withdrawn the CA rating on Reliance Com's uh, senior secured notes. This move comes after Reliance Com missed its scheduled payment of interest, which is considered a default under Moody's definitions. Remember, on 6th of November, Reliance Communications announced that after the invocation of the strategic debt restructuring scheme by the lenders, they are under a debt standstill period until December 2018, as it looks to complete a CDR process. Cement companies, they'll be in focus uh, perhaps on the red side of trade today as the Supreme Court has banned pet coke usage as far as their fuel is concerned. Nigel is here with the details. Nigel, how bad would this be and what are the stocks that will get impacted? You know, Mangalam, from Friday evening, I've been uh, uh, speaking to various industry experts. Mm -hmm. They said last year, demonetization hit us. This time, this is what's going to hit us uh, in the month of November. To run you through the news, remember there was a pet coke that, uh, ban that was prevalent in the NCR region. Everyone thought it was going to be, you know, uh, restricted only till there. But the Supreme Court verdict has come out and now it's extended to the states of Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan as well as Haryana. So this is going to really hit them. Why? Because they'll have to source an alternative fuel that could increase the cost of power and fuel as well as transport costs. In addition to that, you know, there could be some impact even on, on cement production in the near term. And what about the inventory of pet coke? Because this ban is coming in into, you know, into effect immediately. Now, just to give you some numbers, the spot pet coke prices are at around $110 per ton. But remember, that's 8,000 kilocal. If you're using imported coal, it'll be at around $100 per ton. And that's at 6,000 kilocal. Kilocal basically is a calorific value that you're talking about. If you're using domestic coal, then it's even lower. The kilocal will be around 4,000 uh, kilocal approximately. So you'll effectively have to use two tons of coal to make up for that one ton of pet coke that you were using. The bottom line, basically, if you're going to be switching to thermal coal, then your cost of, of power and fuel is going to jump up by nearly around 15 to around 20 percent. Which are the companies that are going to get impacted? Shri Cement. It, its usage of pet coke is nearly around 100 percent. And North accounts for nearly around 75 percent of uh, its exposure. So Shri Cement is going to be the stock that's going to get hit very, very hard. The other companies that will be impacted will be the likes of Ultratech Cement, the JK Cement Twins, as well as Ambuja and ACC. City, in fact, has uh, come out with a note. They're saying that Shri, Shri is going to get hit because, uh, and the EBITDA hit could be nearly around 5% because the capacity that is exposed to these areas is nearly around 70%. Ultratech uh, and ACC, as well as Ambuja, their EBITDA could get hit by nearly around 1% because close to 10% of their capacity is exposed to these uh, areas. Bottom line, City is saying that close to percent to around 5% could be the hit on the EBITDA. What can companies do? They can go ahead and try to increase prices, but demand isn't that great. So that's the problem uh, for them. And in addition to this, you know, you thought you only had to deal with the pet coke uh, ban. Well, there is a sand mining ban as well in Rajasthan. And remember, Rajasthan accounts for roughly around 30% of the total cement produced in North India. So that's another negative. In terms of pet coke, we're looking at an alternative play. You'll have to use lignite as well as coal. So the beneficiaries could be Coal India and GMDC. 
Okay, all right, Nigel. Thanks very much for that. Uh, but uh, you do have some news on emphasis and details and contours about the buyback. Absolutely, uh, Ekta. You know, if you uh, on Friday evening we got some details. Well, when was the buyback going to be open and when is it going to go on till? So that should flash for you on the screen. It's starting on November 30th. The you know the broad details we already had. It's a 13,000 crore buyback. The number of shares as well were known, nearly around 11 crore, and the buyback price as well. That's already known, around 1,150. Retail investors they were focusing on this big time. Why? Because 15% of the total buyback would be reserved for them. That would amount to around 1,950 crores uh, in an absolute value. And number of shares will be 1.7 crore shares. Invoices, they've come out with a very good release. They're saying that, in fact, if you're coming in the reserve category, then 23 shares will be uh, bought back out of the total 81 that will be tendered in. So that works out to around 28.5%. And if you're in the general category, then obviously uh, uh, far lower shares uh, will be bought back for the number that you're uh, tendering in. A lot of retailers are asking who is eligible for, uh, for uh, you know, to come under this retail category. Well, you needed to hold shares on the record date. That is on November 1st. So effectively, on T-2, you needed to buy the shares so that on November 1st, these shares were in your account. Now, on November 1st, the close price was at around 927 rupees. So effectively, if you have to come in the reserve retail category, you needed to hold shares amounting to around 2 lakh rupees. Divide that by around 927 rupees. You should be holding around 215 uh, shares as of that day. Then you'll be eligible for this category. You know, we are at CNBC TV18. We're looking at the number of shareholders. And that had increased, telling you that a lot of people were playing this. So effectively, between June and September, the total increase in the number of shareholders was nearly around 20%. Now, remember, at the start of this year, we were working with a number of from 2.9 crore shares will be eligible under the retail category. Now, guess what? On Friday, we have the release that's come out. It's not 2.9 crore, it's 5.9 crore shares. Mm. So effectively, if you're looking to, you know, at one point of time, you're working with 1.7 crore shares are going to be bought back out of 2.9, you'll be mistaken because now that number has gone to 5.97. The denominator has expanded, telling you that the acceptance ratio now, assuming everyone tenders in for retail, it will not be 59%, in fact, it will be 29, 28.5%. So the acceptance ratio is far lower. You'll see, Nigel, just give a simple example. If I bought at 900 rupees, then how many of my shares will be bought back? That should be up for you on the screen. 61 shares will be bought back at around 1,150. So you need to sell the remaining shares. That's the 154 shares at around 800 rupees. And you'll say, what, Nigel, if I bought it at around 215 shares at around 950 rupees? Then, in fact, that as well should come up for you. 154 shares will be bought back at 1,150. And the remainder of your shares, you should look to sell at roughly around 870 rupees. So those are the two cases. Okay, all right, Nigel, thanks very much for that. Well, let's move on now. Uh, Manisha Gupta is here with us to talk about what's happening in the commodity and currency space. Manisha, morning, over to you. Thank you so much for that. Well, we started on a very steady note, actually, when it comes to commodities as a space. Starting with the crude oil prices, we did see a good 2% of uh, gains on Friday come in for crude oil prices. But we're just about holding around those levels. There's no follow-through buying coming in. And that is because it is on 30th November, where you have the OPEC annual meeting in Vienna, so ahead of that, you wouldn't see too much of a long or short position being created. But there are a lot of numbers being thrown around. China now is emerging as the biggest importer of crude oil. It also is the biggest investor when it comes to renewable energy, etc. And the markets would continue to watch out for the overall global supply situation, electrical vehicle movement, etc. And the crude oil prices would take cues from that. Having said that, we are still holding above $60 for the Brent prices, and that seems quite well on charts there. What hasn't, uh, again, uh, been uh, watching too much of a buying really has been the gold and silver prices. A good 1% gains is what we saw on Friday. It still is trading at a multi-month highs, but we haven't been able to break above that $1,300 per ounce level. Uh, this market as well is getting ready for the U.S. FOMC meeting on December 13th for an interest rate hike. So ahead of that, it is going to be choppy. And the most important cue for the Indian markets really is that uh, the gold in Indian markets is trading at a discount. Even with the wedding season on and the kind of sales that the markets were anticipating isn't really there. So not such a good news for the Indian jewelry guys as well. And definitely not for the physical buying when it comes to gold prices. All right, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. We'll watch out for all the cues coming in from the commodities arena. But let's move on to some non-market news. Miss World Crown, that one returns to India after 17 years. Miss India Manushi Chiller has become the sixth Indian to win the coveted Miss World Crown. Hailing from Haryana, 
The 21-year-old medical student Manushi won both the head-to-head -head challenge as well as the beauty with a purpose segment of the Miss World competition. Chiller competed against 108 contestants from various countries in the competition being held at Sanya City Arena in China. All right, and with that, it's a wrap on Power Breakfast, but we're going to leave you with our Bullseye contestants and what they've picked for this fresh new week. First of all, for today, on the buy side is going to be Tata Global. Uh, long positions can be created here, keeping a stop loss of 248 for the target of 275. Next call on the buy side is going to be Jubilee and Food. And stop loss for Jubilee and Food has to be maintained at uh, 1716 for the target of 1850. The third call on the buy side is going to be United Spirits. And stop loss for United Spirits has to be maintained at 3100 for the target of 3350. And the final call on the buy side is going to be Minda Corp. And stop loss for Minda Corp has to be maintained at 176 for the target of 200. Our first call is a buy call on Ajanta Pharma for a target of 1385, stop loss at 1228. Second buy would be on Mindtree for a target of 545, stop loss at 506. Third call would be a buy call on Indo count for a target of 140, 141, stop loss at 123. And final call would be a sell call on IGL for a target of 284, stop loss at 307.25. My first buy is on Polaris Consulting for a target of 384. Stop loss below 340. My second buy call is on Everity Industries for target of 434. Stop loss below 387. Third buy call is on Gati Limited for target of 147. Stop loss below 124. And my last and final call is a buy on Minda Corporation for target of 196. Stop loss below 173.